What is a global phenomenon and what role do you play in it? As we go about our daily routines, keeping the house organized, performing our jobs well, keeping up with friends and family, we're all secluded in a small nucleus of the world. Bringing in meditation, qigong, yoga, and tai chi, these activities can be done individually, but more often than not, people gather to participate in them together. And when this happens, there's a global shift in consciousness that has been measured and documented. Lynn McTaggart, with her intention experiments, has measured these kinds of phenomenons repeatedly and has expanded programs to support people with intention gatherings. My guest today, Bill Douglas, from World Tai Chi and Qigong Day, and now on a second global event, the Global Transformation Project, is working to expedite mind-body education worldwide and has been creating these waves of consciousness for almost three decades. Based out of the Mind Body Institute at the University of Kansas Medical Center, he offers a Tai Chi class for self-care on a weekly basis with profound results. Doug is an award-winning author of six books about mind body practices and meditation. He's been published in several languages and Deepak Chopra has called him the gift to the world. His latest book is the new second edition for The Gospel of Science, Mind-Blowing New Science on Ancient Truths to Heal Our Stress, Lives, and Planet. And here is the description that's written for it. It is not uncommon for a book to claim to be life-altering or world-altering. What is rare is for a book's author to provide science proving their book literally, positively affected the entire planet in a scientifically measurable way. I just love that. These world-altering effects offer profoundly beautiful possibilities, not just for the planet, but for our personal lives. The science in this book can dramatically lower your stress, improve your aspect of your life, reduce stress, and ignite hope. And in a world of constant alarming media, things may seem a bit hopeless at times, but new science proves the opposite. We're on the cusp of a personal and global transformation. You're listening to Be Well with Michelle Greenwell, sponsored by the Cape Breton Tea Company and Dance Debut Inc. It's my extreme pleasure to welcome today Bill Douglas to the show. Welcome and thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thanks so much for having me, Michelle. <laughs> I've been really looking forward to it. <laughs> it's always lovely to talk Tai Chi with people and, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, instructional sides of things too. So, um, so I'm happy mm -hmm. for that. Um, I always start by pulling a card from my um, Affirmations for the Body and Biofield deck. And this is my way of goal setting for this occasion, because the energy between what you do and what I do, I know is going to raise a lot of um, energy and vitality and consciousness. And I'd love for people to be able to feel that balance and flow. So, so nice. what I did is, and I always just kind of... Um, the, the deck, so those people on the podcast won't be able to see, but I'm going to hold up the deck. So it's a fairly thick deck. And what I usually do is tap on it and cut it. So I don't actually look through it to see if I can find the right card for the occasion. <laughs> but what I pulled from the deck was this piece here. So for those people on the podcast, it's purple blue ribbons of color and they come from the center and they wave out from the center. Um, this is actually a photograph of nature from Cape Breton, and it's been run through different filters to create the image that's here. And that's been Beautiful. done by Tanya Levy. Um, so on the back, the affirmation is from meeting the divine, lead with vision, goals, and ability, supporting the flow and manifestation of possibility with those around you. Without ego-based decisions, um, without ego-based decisions, let me try it again. Without ego-based decisions, flow and action quickly engages. Sorry about that. Eighth chakra identification point. So that is our reason for being here, why we do things, and what's going to happen. And I thought, my goodness, did I pick the card for you today? <laughs> <laughs> Lead with vision, goals, and ability. Absolutely. Okay, so the second part is I always like to add... Um, a cup of inspiration, so something to sip on while people are listening to the podcast, so they hopefully will take the time to sit and relax a little bit. So what have you got with you today? Well, I have my favorite substance in the whole universe, and, and that's water. 
<laughs> yeah, and I and uh, I, I I have a couple of granddaughters, and when one of my granddaughters was about three three four ish, she was visiting, and she was drinking a glass of water, and I said, Angelica, I said, uh, when you drink that water, I said, do you feel that silky feeling in your mouth? And then do you feel it going down your throat? And then do you feel it going into your stomach? And then you feel it spreading through your stomach? And, you know, she I didn't think she was paying any attention at all. You know, kids that age, they're bouncing all over the place. And then about five minutes later, I'd completely forgotten that I told her that. <clears throat> and I, you know, I just happened to be looking past her out the window. And I noticed, you know, out of the corner of my eye that she was taking a drink of water, you know, and she took a drink, a drink of water and she goes like this. She goes, And then she looked at me and goes, I feel that gong gong. <laughs> and so, so I'm always, I'm, I'm always trying to get them, you know, to just feel their lives, mm -hmm. you know, cause I think that's the best thing I can teach them. You know, I, I don't think I have any like, you know, scholarly advice or anything, but if I can just encourage them to just constantly remember how beautiful it is to experience every little moment that they have, you know, how beautiful the clouds and the sky and mm -hmm. the trees and the grass and the squirrels and the chipmunks. <laughs> well, and, it, and it's true, you know, you put that sip of water in and then you just assume where it's going to go because you're busy yeah, well, doing you're, the next thing. Yeah, John Lennon had a great line in one of his songs. He said, uh, life, it's, it was to his son. And he said, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. Yes, yes, and exactly, the, exactly. Yeah, and, and then it's never any fun. You know, it's never, any, nothing's ever special or sacred or fun or anything. When we're always thinking about the next thing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And we've all had conversations. I mean, we've all done this. It's not like any of us are above it or anything. I mean, all the mind body practices I do, they help me tremendously to be more present, but it's not like I have a master or anything. You know, I, I go through all this stuff, but, uh, but yeah, it's, you know, it's like, uh, uh, you know, when you're having conversations with people, if you're having a conversation with somebody that's present, you know, in the moment, it's a whole different experience than if you're having a conversation with somebody that you know that their mind is always, you know what I mean? It's pulling out the cell phone, looking at the watch, you know, all those things. Yeah. Racing it's to just, the next. It's, yeah. It's just this surface, this skipping across the surface kind of connection, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Which is why I'm hoping people take the time when they go to listen to the podcast that they actually stop. I know some people do that while they're in the car or out in the garden, but at least if you're doing those kinds of things, hopefully, or while you're cultivating, you're still allowing that that opportunity to be present in the conversation and to feel the nurturing that's coming to you as a result of the conversation. Well, and then the, and then the science shows that when we go into sensory awareness as opposed to intellectual awareness, uh, when we're feeling things, uh, the HeartMath Institute research they call it heart-centered consciousness, and mm -hmm. it's very healing. It's very healing. Uh, I, uh, other science calls it gratitude consciousness is when we're enjoying the sensation of our being and experience, you know, with having a sip of tea or whatever, just fully being present and fully enjoying it. And it actually, uh, that state of consciousness actually changes the, uh, the molecular structure of the heart and the brain in positive ways. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, that's, that's one of the things that I think is so cool about how the universe was put together because it's like the universe wants to celebrate and so when we celebrate an experience, uh, you know, that's that it, it has these healing effects on our body and mind and nervous system and heart and everything. And uh, I just find that so poetically beautiful. You know, what a beautiful way to create mm -hmm. an existence, you know, mm -hmm. where you get rewarded for celebrating your existence. You know? Exactly, exactly. Um, well, uh, what I'm going to bring forward here is um, the... the Cape Breton Tea Company is a sponsor. That's the company that I'm currently running and playing with. Um, and so I put together a tea here that is from Mission for Change. So this is to support a family in Africa, in Malawi, um, family of now 14 because they just lost their, their mother, the, mm. the matriarch of the, of the clan. Um, so this blend here is a special blend put together for that. And I've put it inside my happiness mug. It does smile at you on one side, but the, the side that I'm showing out to, uh, to Bill and to anybody who's watching the vodcast version, I've got a wink going on. So just to remember <laughs> to find the humor in everything that we're doing. So, 
So, Bill, I give you a cheer. Thank you so much for coming and joining. Cheers. And we'll savor this sip. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Um, where I wanted to start with our conversation today is you've done two huge world initiatives. Many people, it's it's a stretch for them to do one, but you've chosen to. But you also have your, your writings too, which in themselves are transformational. So, so there's more than that. And I'm curious what made you think your impact, you know, because sometimes people go, well, I'm just one person, and mm -hmm. how could I make an impact? Mm -hmm. What made you think you could make a difference, and it gave you that impetus to say, I'm going to do this world initiative? Yeah, uh, well, it, it, the whole thing, it's been, it's been a lifelong process, and I think, I think we all kind of have a reason for being on the planet, you know, and we're all unfolding our lives and trying to figure out what that reason is and and we know when we touch into it because everything feels kind of exciting you know it's like you can't wait to get up the next morning when you're you know finding that thread you know that we're here for or whatever that is and so uh uh the whole journey it, it actually started in my childhood but i didn't realize it you know it's like i had to go through 66 years and then look back and see how it all unfolded but, uh, but it's all been going into alpha state, that meditative alpha state where we let go. You know, in, in, in Tai Chi and Qigong and Taoism, we call it song or song. You know, it's that, you know, it's that abject surrender, you know, like the sinking when we sink in Tai Chi and, and surrender to the flow flowing through us. William C.C. C. Chen, he said, I don't, he said, I don't move. He said, I don't flow energy. Energy flows me. And so, you know, we're learning how to relax out of the way of it. And, and, a, and a huge part of all the mind-body practices, you know, that's what brings us all into one family is, uh, uh, you know, Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation, yoga, and mindfulness is that alpha state. They all have the ability to produce that alpha state when we do the, when we do the practices mindfully, you know, and we let go and we surrender ourselves into the flow or the samadhi or, you know, uh, whatever it might be for the different disciplines. But they, <clears throat> but they all have that where you let go, go into alpha state. And so uh, what, I, what going into alpha state did was it constantly enabled me to keep letting go of what I thought I was so that I could open. Well, the Tao Te Ching says, when, we let, when I let go of what I am, I become what I might be. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, it was like I would just constantly had to go into this. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and a lot of people, uh, the Tai Chi and Qigong world, it's a, it's a wildly diverse world. In fact, I got an email from a Tai Chi teacher in Chicago, I think, and he said, Bill, he said, I got to give you a lot of credit. He goes, trying to organize Tai Chi teachers is like herding cats and because uh, everybody's very independent thinkers. And so I remember uh, we got uh, inducted into the Internal Arts Hall of Fame in 2009 in New York. And while I was there, I, I just happened to be walking up the steps uh, behind some other guys that were, you know, they were like, uh, you know, kind of Kung Fu Tai Chi guys, you know. And uh, they were really upset. Uh, I, you know, they didn't know who I was. Nobody knew who I was. But anyway, they were really upset that I got inducted in the Internal Arts Hall of Fame. And one of them said, yeah, all he, all he did was just organize, you know, a, a World Tai Chi Day event, a World Tai Chi event. And, uh, and I was thinking, man, it was like out of all these years of doing Tai Chi, I can't think of anything that really tested my Wu Wei and my Tai Chi flow and my letting go, letting go, letting go than trying to organize people that spoke all different languages in all different countries, all different religions, you know, all different persuasions in every form that you could imagine. And, uh, and it was just constantly going into that, that alpha state, you know, that, that flow, that letting go, that drift. And, uh, and then that's what enabled me to navigate the waters and kind of see, oh, okay, this will lead me here and this will lead me there and this will lead me there. But all my life I've, 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 I guess, I guess I knew that I was going to be, you know, that I was going to be trying to get, uh, not teaching people how to meditate, uh, but, or how to do mind body. But uh, what I've found that my skill was is, uh, you know, I've had people that said, Bill, why don't you go into advertising? You're so good at promotion. Uh, but what they don't understand is I can't promote something unless, unless I'm living it and breathing it. And I just mm -hmm. feel so profoundly that people need to know about it because that's the only way I can have the esteem to do it, you know, uh, mm -hmm. if it's something like that. And so when I was a child, I actually, I had an angelic experience and, you know, and I, I kind of put it in quotation marks because I don't know if it was an angel. All I know is that I was six years old and it looked like an angel. 
<laughs> and uh, uh, and it was beautiful, uh, but I was scared. I was kind of scared. <clears throat> and so anyway, I, I ended, what I realized looking back was I had an out of body experience. And uh, it took me and it flew me across town and it put me down in an alley between a church and a Sunday school. And it started teaching me how to breathe, how to take big breaths. And then on the sighing exhales, just let go, you know, everything mentally, emotionally, physically. I can't tell you how it told me this, how it taught me this, but I can just tell you that I knew that that's what it was teaching me. And, and, and as I got better at it, I started lifting up off the bricks in the alleyway. And pretty soon I was doing these big loop-de-loops, uh, you know, up into the sky and coming down. And, uh, and I remember this angelic figure, or that's what it looked like to me uh, uh, at six years old. Uh, it just looked like it looked satisfied, like, okay, I had gotten whatever it was that it was supposed to be teaching me how to do. And then the next morning I woke up and I, and <clears throat> I just grabbed, I just got up, got dressed, grabbed my lunch sack, started running down the alley to school because I was going to teach all the other kids how to, how to fly, right? <laughs> and I didn't realize that what it was was I was going to teach them how to meditate because uh, I didn't know what meditation was. And, uh, but I knew I was going to teach them how to fly. That's what I was going to teach them. And so I'm running down the alley and I take a big breath and I start lifting up off of the alleyway and then splat down in a mud puddle. <clears throat> and so I was so disappointed, you know, cause I wasn't going to be able to go to school and show the kids how to fly. What I didn't realize was that it was going to be about uh, almost 40 years later for, for, and it wasn't going to be, and I, and I wasn't going to be teaching them how to fly. I was just going to be giving them the science. That would, that would convince, you know, people at all levels of society that they needed to find a Tai Chi or a Qigong or a meditation or a mindfulness or a, a yoga teacher in their community. Mm -hmm. And that's what that's what everything that I've done. I've constantly pulled myself out of it uh, as much as I could so that I could uh, uh, work with mind body people all over the planet, because uh, what I've come to the conclusion of I, I think this last book that I that I finished the new second edition of the gospel of science uh, I think that was where all this was leading because that's where I put all this 40 years of science together <clears throat> and what it convinced me of uh, you know and there's nothing like writing a 700 page book of science because you have to read it over and over and over again you know especially if you can't afford editors uh, which mm -hmm. I couldn't so I had to be my own editor and uh, uh and, and so reading that science over and over again, what it did was it instilled in me something that I haven't really seen any other mind-body teachers or leaders or spokespeople really comprehend the way that I comprehend it. And that is, is that when you look at all this science, uh, it is literally insane. It is literally insane that this isn't part of public education because it increases our IQ substantially. I mean, not a little bit. It, it, uh, practicing going into Alpha State on a regular basis, you know, whether it's any of the big five, Tai Chi, Qigong, meditation, yoga, or mindfulness, if we practice them in that flow state and that mindless, you know, that mindful state, uh, we go into the Alpha State. So it increases our IQ, it improves our GRE reading score, our verbal fluency, our math proficiency skills, it reduces bullying, it treats ADHD symptoms, <clears throat> it cuts students that uh, practice Qigong meditation were 50% less likely to catch colds during the school year. And so what we're talking about, Her Dr. Herbert Benson at Harvard said that up to 90% of the illnesses sending people to the doctors are caused by stress and best treated or prevented by mind body practices. And, and he meant, and he said, that's the big five that I just mentioned, Tai Chi Qigong, meditation, yoga, and mindfulness. And also repetitive prayer produces an alpha state as well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so he, so what we're talking about is the potential of saving trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, not just once, but every year in the future by simply teaching kids how to do mind body and what world tai chi and qigong day really opened my eyes to because i didn't know i'm i'm from a small western kansas town that's where i am right now and uh uh and i had no idea until we started organizing world tai chi day and then i realized mind body teachers are in every city in every country on the planet it would be so easy for schools to start interviewing local mind body teachers and find the ones that are best capable of working with children and you teach kids in age appropriate ways from kindergarten through 12th grade and it would be completely optional so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to get a united nations resolution uh passed uh to advocate public education to look at mind body as a part of 
public education. And it wouldn't be mandatory for any country. It wouldn't be mandatory for any school. It wouldn't be mandatory for any student because we've taught in public education over the last 30 years. And one of the things that we always do, and it doesn't matter whether it's a public school or a prison or a corporate wellness program or whatever it is, we always tell them that if it's a captive audience that we're going to be teaching, <clears throat> we always tell them there has to be an opt out. People can't be forced to be there because the only way mind body works is if it's your idea. If you want to, if you want to give it a whirl, and and so that's the way we set it up. And we've in all these years of public education, I think I only had one kid in one class that got up and walked out, and he was really sorry he did after it was over because when he came back, all the other kids were kind of in a state of awe, you know, from what they'd experienced. <laughs> and uh, so it, this this would be so easy to to do, to just bring the mind body teachers that exist in every city into the public school, interview them, talk to them, see which ones can work with kids at different levels. Because because uh, uh, what we envision is teaching them all five, teaching them meditation, yoga, tai chi, qigong, and mindfulness. And with if you do it an hour a day for you know five days a week, kids are going to get exposed to these things in depth. And what you'll have is you'll have a whole generation of mind-body masters, you know, who aren't going to get hypertension, who aren't going to get diabetes, you know, all these things. Uh, these things will just melt away. And uh, we're talking trillions of dollars in saved health health costs in the future. And also a kinder and gentler world because uh, one of the things that happens when we go into these alpha states is the empathy and compassion part of the brain gets larger and the fear and stress part of the brain gets smaller. And I can't think of a better prescription for a planet that went from 2 billion people when I was when I was born to 7 billion people right now. And we've got to figure out how to deal with this whole new world. And everything has changed except for our consciousness. And Albert Einstein said, you cannot solve a problem with the same consciousness that created it. And so we're what we're offering is a way to get mind-body into public education and literally change the consciousness of a whole new generation in nothing but incredibly positive and beneficial ways. Uh, there's no negative side effects to this at all. And it's all, see, this is the, we're the first mind-body generation who's had all this science that, mm -hmm. that proves all this. And, the, and one of the things that I've been kind of disappointed when I've talked to a lot of Tai Chi and Qigong, because that's mo mostly my world is Tai Chi and Qigong, but I'm, you know, I'm, this is a coalition. We want yoga, meditation, mindfulness. We want the mind-body community to come together on this. But I've been really disappointed because, uh, you know, it's like they don't uh, sometimes grasp uh the full breadth and depth of what it is that we're offering the world. You know, we experience it in our lives, but it's really easy to diminish it, mm -hmm. you know, because you don't have validation on the news. And what I always explain to my students, the only reason you don't hear about this stuff on the news is not it's not because it's not incredibly effective. It's because it doesn't make anybody billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't make anybody billions of dollars, you're not going to see it on the news. That's just the way that it works. And uh, so uh, it's like, the mind body, if the global mind body community can find our esteem, you know, and recognize the treasures that we are and what we have to offer, and we could get it out to kids. So, like kids in kindergarten, you could be teaching them real playful stuff, uh, animal qigong, you know, just things to get them to feel their body and breathe, you know, mind body things. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you just make it fun. You want to keep it fun all the way through K through 12. Uh, you don't ever want it to be this serious, you know, masochistic endeavor you always want it to be light and fun and, and that's at the core that's what it is you know tai chi and qigong at their core they're just it's just fun it's just the celebration you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and i was thinking about as you were talking about the benefits physically within the body but then we also have the children's opportunity to learn yep. because that's all enhanced and so the opportunity then to have less time on a particular subject or less time working on skills that maybe were challenging before, you, you smooth out the opportunity for them to learn through that piece. Mm -hmm. And it's it's an area that they don't really talk about because they always have that blocked time for the different subjects. And, yeah. it's, and it's the same attitude as well about you want people to be there to do the mind-body practice. Mm -hmm. It's the same you want them there to be present to learn each of the subjects, even if it's not their favorite. But once you know, you've practiced, it's different. Yeah, yeah, you know, one of the things that just occurred to me when you were talking about this is I remember when ADD and ADHD became like a big deal, you know, on the public scene. And uh, all of a sudden, 
there were public schools all, all across the United States. I don't know what it was like in other countries, but all across the United States, there were schools that were having uh, people come in and talk to, you know, school health people and educators and parents. And they were telling him, they were giving him a list of things that might, you know, uh, be, uh, make their uh, children fall into the category of ADD, ADHD. And then they had, you know, rec pharmaceutical recommendations to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So how could that happen? But we're not having people go into public education and tell teachers uh, about a science, a scientifically proven way to get into an alpha state, which will increase the student's IQ reduce their ADD, ADHD symptoms, reduce anxiety and depression symptoms, as well as any pharmaceutical. That's what the research shows. Meditation can reduce uh, uh, dep uh, depression and anxiety symptoms, as well as any pharmaceutical, except no negative side effects, only positive side effects. And while it's doing all that, it's improving their GRE reading score, their math proficiency skill, their verbal fluency, you know, all the things that we want a student to be able to do in education. It just it doesn't make any sense uh, if there was this wholesale move uh, to get everybody educated about ADD, ADHD, but there's no wholesale movement, you know, to get mind body. And and again, this is where the mind body community we have to find our esteem. You know, we have to stop playing low. You know what I mean? Because we've been, I mean, I you know I've been teaching in hospitals for 30 years. And, uh, you know, and I've been to some major conferences, uh, you know, diabetes conferences, you know, major like regional, national conferences. And the mind body people like me, we never make a keynote speech. We're never the keynote speech. And our table is usually down the hall where you can't quite see it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But all the pharmaceutical companies, they, they've got their booths right out there in front, right? Yeah. <laughs> the stuff that we're offering could radically reduce the need for a lot of pharmaceuticals and uh we need to own up to this we need to, we're you know our countries are facing a, a, a financial health care crisis that's unprecedented in history and it just doesn't have to be it simply does not have to be when you look at the science you realize if we were teaching kids how to how to do self-care you know, how, how to connect with their mind and body because it, it boosts t-cell counts it supports vitamin d levels it heals DNA and increases brain size, shrinks the stress and fear part, you know, reduces all those stress chemicals. And, you know, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. I had to, I had to write a 700 page book to get all the science in there. That's how much science there is. And it's all, and it's all mind bending, you know, mind, mind bendingly beautiful and hopeful. And it's just, I, I just think it's like the biggest scandal in history that people aren't doing what I'm doing, which is, you know, shouting from the rooftops, it's time to get mind body into public education. It's, I mean, it's all science. It's, you know, alpha state brainwaves. That's, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree. But, you know, but you, know, well, you know, when you're getting in there with Tai Chi or yoga, you're getting all the cardiovascular benefit. You know, you're building muscle mass and bone tissue and all that stuff too. So it's like a, it's kind of like a, a, a PE health science, you know, mind body connection hybrid I mean, it would be so far beyond anything that we've, you know, thought of like physical education in the past. You know, Can you like imagine a science. gym class, you know, that started with spiral actions and whole body movement and the opportunity to connect your hand to your eyes or massaging through the bottom of the feet um, mm -hmm. just to be able to coordinate things and then say, oh, now let's go do badminton or basketball. Well, I mean, why even have all those things? I mean, kids can learn how to do all that stuff on their own. Why not teach them some of the highest sciences in the history of humanity? Why not spend an hour uh, teach, teaching them uh, some Tai Chi, some yoga, some mindfulness? You know, and these things overlap, too, because obviously when you do Tai Chi, when we're doing it at a high level, we're doing it extremely mindfully. You know, we're just present. We're just feeling, you know, feeling the letting go, feeling the flow, you know, feeling that, that loosening and that opening. <clears throat> so <clears throat> all these things overlap. But I mean, why even bother with it? And unfortunately, a lot of schools don't even have PE classes these days, which is a whole other crime. But uh, but uh, but no, I mean, instead of trying to reinstate a re regular PE class, why why spend that time with them when we can be taking them to levels that will change the rest of their life in massively profound ways? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That'll head off disease and save trillions of dollars. So now I'm talking about a whole new way of looking at education. 
uh, with a one hour a day mind body class. And uh, in, in what we're advocating is that it include yoga, tai chi, qigong, meditation, and mindfulness, because those five, we call them the big five, they, they just have mountains of science behind them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There'll come a time, you know, when everybody will go, oh yeah, yeah. I always thought that. <laughs> I was, you know, you know, it'll be everywhere in every school, you know, and people go, yeah, yeah, everybody knew that. Exactly, exactly. When you think about, you, you started the World Tai Chi and Qigong Day, and you, you got it started in, in uh, the U.S., and then it started to, to branch out. What were some of the struggles that you came across as you were going through that process of trying to spread that word out? Well, in the beginning, I mean, the biggest struggle was, you know, when you would contact somebody by email or phone, because that's what we were doing. We were starting to reach out to everybody uh, and saying, you know, saying, OK, this is what we're going to do. <laughs> and so the biggest struggle, you know, in the beginning was, who are you? What are you talking about? <laughs> and that was where I had to keep going back to Alpha State, because that's where we get the validation. You know, when we get when we go into alpha state, that's where we get the clarity that shows us, OK, this is where our energy is going to be best spent. And then you feel that excitement and that tells you, oh, yeah, I'm on track for that. But uh, you have to keep going back to that place because you're not going to get the validation out there. Uh, you get the validation after it becomes what it's going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. But you don't get the validation while you're trying to bring uh, what manifest a uh, uh, a vision of possibility into the hard earth of reality. Uh, that's all uh, a lot of grunt work. But while you're doing the grunt work, it's like you're, you know, you start meeting visionaries around the planet and then they inspire you. And I remember, you know, we would get, uh, uh, you know, every time there was a World Tai Chi Day, we'd have no idea if anybody was participating in it or not. You know, we, we wouldn't really have much of a clue. I mean, we had we have a really big mailing list that goes out around the world, but you don't get a lot of feedback. You know, you don't know whether people are reading them or whatever. And then after the events were after World Tai Chi Day was over, then we would start getting the photos and the videos from the different countries. And it was blowing our minds like that. Uh, Iran had a massive World Tai Chi Day event. It was really beautiful in a really beautiful park in Tehran, Iran. And then Israel had a really cool event. And uh uh, and then Malaysia had just a massive event, and Egypt, uh, just thousands of people. And uh, and then they were getting, you know, uh, and then 25 U.S. governors ended up proclaiming uh, the event. So there were, you know, you would get these little uh, affirmations, you know, that you're on the right track uh, from the external world. But it wasn't like that in the beginning. You know, it was a lot of, uh, you know, I mean, most people, I think a lot of people thought that we had an angle. Uh, you know, that we were just kind of using this to sell something. And uh, so that was good because uh, it made us make sure that we didn't do that. <laughs> you know, it made us really conscious of, you know, not, you know, letting it become, you know, that and it keep, you know, just supporting uh, Tai Chi and Qigong and then later mind body teachers all over the planet with the science. And so we were always feeding them the science and then we were teaching them how to get government proclamations and we were teaching them how to get uh, local and national and international media coverage. And, and we did all the grunt work, you know, we found the links, you know, so that people could just go to a page and just follow it step by step and it wouldn't be hard to do. And so really what we did was we taught Tai Chi and Qigong teachers how to be organizers. Because I'd always been, I, you know, since my youth or young, as a young man, I uh, became, I worked in a Central American refugee camp in the 80s. And that really woke me up. It really woke me up that there's things in the world that we need to change. Uh, and uh, uh, and then later on, you know, it's like, uh, you know, social justice, environmental issues, things like that, I, I would get behind. And so I learned, and you never have a lot of money when you're organizing for those kind of causes. <laughs> None of the causes I ever, ever worked on had made a lot of money uh, or had a lot of money to spend. And so you learn how to do like guerrilla organizing. And so that's how we approached World Tai Chi and Qigong Day. And that's, what we, and that's what we did. We taught Tai Chi and Qigong teachers all over the planet how to be organizers. And so that's what we want to do now with the global mind-body community, including yoga, meditation, and mindfulness. Because if we can all pull together and spread the word on the Global Transformation Project, you know, and just make it a habit to just get it out there in social media and, you know, just ask people, have you signed the petition? And uh, uh, because we want to have at least 100,000 signatures before we start going to the UN missions, because me and Angela, we're, what we're committing ourselves to is uh, contacting individually every United Nations mission on the planet and 
giving them the science, giving them the resolution, and uh, 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 getting the co-sponsors. And this is going to be a lot of work. And uh, uh, it's going to be kind of expensive for us because we're going to have to pay for postage and, you know, all the things. Uh, we're donating all of our, our time to do it. Uh, but uh, we want to have at least 100,000 signatures of people around the planet who say, yes, it's time to do this. Because then when we contact a UN mission, we can say there's 100,000 people, here they are that signed this that think that this is a great idea and that'll get them to pay, you know, it'll get them to take that few seconds extra to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but to be honest with you, I just can't, it's beyond me. Uh, my, I just can't believe that we can't get millions of signatures because there are so many hundreds of millions of people around the planet whose lives have been changed by meditation or Tai Chi or Qigong or mindfulness or yoga. And, uh, you know, it's like it's time to pay it forward. You know, the world needs us. It needs our testimony. You know, it needs us to stand up and say, yeah, yeah, we should be teaching kids how to do this. There's no downside to it. It's all beautiful, natural, and uh, and it would mm -hmm. just change everything. I mean, literally, you know, with trillions of dollars saved year after year, you could literally end mass starvation around the planet. That would only take a little tiny sliver of that savings. <laughs> and uh, most most deaths of children in the world are from dirty water. And it would take relatively little uh, of that trillions of savings every year to clean up, you know, have clean water all over the planet. So we're literally talking about the possibility of global transformation. We could all be a part of this, this healing wave, and it would change history because uh, what the, uh, in my new second edition of the Gospel of Science, I get into all this science and I have the links. It's meticulously endnoted to, so that you can look at the science yourself. But what they're finding is that behaviors, when we, when we, ha when we, change behaviors, you know, fundamental behaviors and how we respond to stress and things like that, uh, they're starting to see that that can actually be passed down through our genes, through our DNA. And so we're talking about changing the future of the history of humanity with people, a, a generation that has higher IQs, you know, better reading skills, better math skills, better verbal fluency, and also <clears throat> increased gamma wave consciousness. Yeah, uh, you know, our our normal brainwave states is beta. That's the busy brainwave state. And then when we go into a meditative state, you know, when we get into the Tai Chi flow or the yoga, you know, uh, 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 you know, relaxation experience, uh, we start to go into alpha state. And then when we go really deep in alpha state, we start to get close to uh, theta. And then when you're in alpha theta, that's a real deep meditative state. And then delta, and then theta is the sleep state. And then delta is the really deep uh, sleep state. Yeah, but gamma is the highest. And what the research shows is that pe uh, people that go into alpha state on a regular basis, they have more gamma wave consciousness. Gamma wave consciousness is it's where we uh, we're looking at issues from multi dimensions. So from all different parts of our mind and consciousness and brain. And then what it does is it gives us those aha moments where we see these simple, elegant solutions to vastly complicated problems. And so Einstein, Tesla, Da Vinci, all the great thinkers you know, throughout human history, that's where, that's where they went to get their aha moments. And Einstein wrote about it pretty extensively. And, uh, and so we could be teaching a whole generation how to go into that gamma wave consciousness. And God knows what kind of inventions or what kind of social ideas or whatever could come out of these kids. And so in Taoism, you know, uh, uh, what we do is we try to relax out of the way of the more elegant order of the universe, you know, the Tao. And uh, so we're, we're constantly trying to let go. And so what happens uh, when we go into, you know, alpha state, you know, the Taoist meditation or Tai Chi or Qigong or, you know, any of these things, uh, when we go into that, we're going into that flow state, and then we can find the simple, elegant solutions to things. Uh, it's really complicated solutions, you know, that just heal things in a myriad ways. Uh, but it doesn't seem like you're doing it. So in the Tao Te Ching, it says, in doing nothing, all things are done. Mm -hmm. And that's what, that's, that's what they were talking about. Uh, it's it's uh, learning how to fix, like, everything without fixing anything. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You just go right to the core, and the core is consciousness. And, you know, it's not just me that knew that. It's like all the, all the quantum physicists, you know, the pioneers in quantum physics, they all knew consciousness is where everything happens from. It all ripples out from here. And, and I think people um, lose track of the 
multidimensional piece of that because we're so linear oriented to get the task done and the decision making process is what's right in front of you when you have that opportunity for that whole multidimensional you can sit in it mm -hmm. like you said it's it's quick from one spot to the next spot of the solution but you can't mm -hmm. see that when you're on that linear road because you can only take the the things that are right in front of you you can't pick anything yeah. else up yeah, the way yes. the way I, the way I describe it is uh, the way the world works. You know, it's in beta brainwave state or yang yang consciousness. You know, and the Tao Te Ching it said, uh, you know, it said know know the yang world, you know how the world works. You know, don't don't be an idiot, <laughs> but keep to the yin. You know, the yin is the the receptive consciousness, the open consciousness, and uh, you know, and the only way to do it is just to keep going back there. It's like I have to go back there constantly. You know, it's like uh, uh, I forgot how hard it was to organize World Tai Chi Day. Uh, you know, because uh, you know, after 23 years, it got to the point where you know, kind of everybody everybody who wanted to know knew what it was. You know, they'd all heard of it, and you know, everybody knew that we'd organized it. You know, and all this stuff, and so you know, so every year it just kept going on. You know, but it wasn't a hard lift. It was really, you know, you were kind of being lifted by it, really, more than mm -hmm. anything. But then when we started, when when we got the inspiration for the Global Transformation Project, because I'd collected all that science, and then when the book came out, I had to reread it over and over again. And uh, yeah, and I had forgotten how hard it was to get people to see a vision. Uh, it's like you have to kind of grow it like a like a plant. Uh, it's like, you, you know, you have to water it and protect it and defend it, you know, <laughs> constantly. And uh, 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 but the only way that I've been able to in, uh, endure that is to just keep going back, keep going back to that off state, you know, do the Qigong, do the Tai Chi, do the meditation. And I just have to go back there in alpha state over and over and over again, because when I go back there uh, into that clarity of consciousness, then I'm in this space where I go, yeah, it's crazy. We're not teaching school kids all over the planet how to do this. Why not be saving trillions of dollars? Why not be lessening violence all over the planet? You know, which is another thing that, it, that uh, mind body practices have been doing the science on that is really incredible. And, uh, uh, but then, you know, you go out and you get into the tangles of the world. And so uh, uh, the way I look at it is the world looks at it in the beta brainwaves, like it's looking at a tree, you know, say the tree of the world or society or whatever. And everybody's scampering around and they're all, they all have their doctor glasses on and they're looking at the sick leaves. And everybody's looking at all the different sick leaves, you know, the social sick leaves, the you know, health, physical sick leaves, the mental, emotional sick leaves, you know, all the different sick leaves in society and trying to figure out how to fix that leaf, right? But what mind-body does is it, it it goes right to the root. You know, it goes right to the root and it just pours water and nutrients right into the root. Uh, and it's very, it's not labor intensive, you know, and it doesn't cost a huge amount of money to do it. It would be so cheap. So cheap to, for schools around the planet to start interviewing the local mind body teachers, and they would find some great ones because I've met them all over the planet. You know, mm -hmm. they're there, they're right there in the community, and they could be in the schools sharing this wisdom that mm -hmm. you know was evolved over thousands of years in India and China, uh, and and it further evolved through scientific measurement. You know, it's like we can measure brain waves now. We can know when people are going into alpha state and so schools over the planet they could you know for like two or three hundred bucks they could get a brainwave sensor and they could actually be teaching kids how to go into alpha state mm -hmm. it's just simple it, there's it's just so simple but i have to you have to keep going back to that clarity space uh because otherwise the you know the you know the tangles and the chaos that the world perceives all the time you know a lot of it's not even real it, you know once we start going in, within on a regular basis we start to see a lot of that stuff out there. It's just all, you know, it's meant to sell magazines and newspapers and clickbait and, you know, stuff like that. I was chatting with a colleague today and we were talking about how when you're, you know, you're feeling that anxiety inside or you're not quite sure what you want to do, no one on the outside knows. Yeah. It's only what you know on the inside. And so when you stop to realize that is only on the inside, what's on the yeah. outside then all of yeah. a sudden it, it's different and you think, oh, do I really need to hold on to this or can I actually let it go? And if yeah. I let it go, how's everybody going to interact with me? The same way they would have before, except you were deciding you were going to come from a different place because it was that place of fear. Yes. So it takes it all to a higher level. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I started, I started shooting free throws. I, you know, I got, 
you, you know, I'm getting a little older and I just got to a point where I decided I'm just going to start, you know, I mean, I teach, I teach all week long, but that's not the same as your own practice. And yeah. so I started, you know, really dedicating, rededicating myself and really doing the meditation, really doing the Qigong, moving Qigong, really doing the Tai Chi. <clears throat> and then I, I decided I'd go down to the gym every day and, and do Qigong and Tai Chi. And then I decided I was going to start shooting free throws. And I've, I've only shot free throws for about five months in the last 45 years. I was a lousy basketball player. But I just did it to kind of get away from the computer, you know. And uh, and anyway, I was shooting baskets one day, and uh, there was a kid in the gym, uh, about eleven years old. And uh, I, you know, I, and we were the only ones in the gym. And I kept noticing out of the corner of my eye that he never missed. I mean, he never missed. And that was so bizarre to me because when I was in school and I played basketball, if I if I threw the ball up and it actually hit some part of the backboard, I considered that a tremendous success. That's how that's how bad I was. Uh, and, uh, and and so I went over and, and talked to him. And uh, and I think that that was a, a, a big deal. I, don't, I think a lot of people wouldn't have, you know, kind of humbled themselves to an 11 year old kid. But I did. And I went over and I said, uh, I said, I noticed when you're shooting, you never miss. And he goes, yeah, he goes, I'm a free throw shooting champion. And I said, yeah, but how do you do that? You know, how do you not miss? And uh, he looked perplexed at first, like nobody had ever asked him to, you know, put it in that way and then uh, it's like I could see something you know dawning in his eyes and he said okay he said look he said this is what I do he said you know when I'm dribbling the ball I relax and then what I do is I just stay I, 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 I continue to relax and I let the shot come up through my body and out through my hand and if I stay in that state of relaxation all the way through I know I'm going to make it the instant that it leaves my fingertips and, and conversely, I know I'm going to miss it if something, you know, hitched or tightened. And so uh, once he told me that, I thought, wow, that he's it's Tai Chi. That's what he's telling me. He's telling me to use my Tai Chi for shooting free throws. And so my free throw average went up like 30 percent, 30 percent in like a week. And uh, and then it's gone up since then. I'm 66 years old and I'm shooting free. I'm shooting free throws at a better, higher percent. Not every day, but there's there's. A, a, a lot of days when I'll go in and I'll shoot a higher free throw percentage than the National Basketball Association averages at 66 years old and a guy that sucked at basketball. And, and what it is, is it's just letting go, you know, going into that flow state. It's, you know, it's the pineal gland. It's the, you know, letting go. It's the alpha state, letting it flow through or the flow of Tai Chi and Qigong or whatever. And, uh, uh, and just letting it flow through. And then as I practiced this, I started to realize that it was ego. It was it's ego because if I'm if I'm when you're in the flow state, when you go into alpha state, you're not you're connected to everything. You're just part of the field of everything. Uh, but then when we go into beta brain waves, then that's the you know, that's that's when we're thinking of me as an individual separate mm -hmm. from the universe. And uh, uh, one of my students got me a brainwave sensor. It's called Muse. Uh, if you Google Muse, you'll you'll find it. And it has a phone app and it syncs with that. <clears throat> tells you what your brain waves is while you go into these little two, three minute meditations. And I'd been meditating for, you know, Nagong for decades uh, before my, a student bought that for me. And uh, man, I'll tell you what, that really helped a lot because it was kind of hit or miss all those years. You know, it was like, uh, you know, you spend 30 minutes meditating, but you're, you're not in alpha all that time. You know, you're in alpha sometimes. Uh, but when I got the brainwave sensor, it was great because it gave you instant feedback. And so, uh, you know, when it would start, you'd be in beta brain waves, you know, and then you'd start breathing and it'd give you suggestions for relaxation and letting go. And then what would uh, what would happen was when you're in busy beta brain waves, you would hear a sound from your phone app and it sounded like you were in a tropical rainforest and the rain was falling. And so it wasn't jarring or anything, but you just knew you were in busy brain waves, normal brain waves. But then as you breathe and start to let go, let, the, let your mind just kind of let go and kind of go into that drift. Uh, then the rain would go away. And so then you'd know you were going into alpha state because the rain went away. But then if you started getting into an even deeper meditation, when you started getting to that, close to that, you know, alpha theta, then birds would start chirping in the background. And so then you'd know that you were in a deep meditative state. And then when you'd hear the birds chirping, you'd think, wow, I'm a really good meditator. And then the rain would start falling again, right? 
and because that was the that was the ego, right? Yeah. And it's not the you know it's not the ego that we think about in the West. Like, oh, he's an ego. He's all full of himself. I have no problem with that. If people are doing things for the right reasons, I love a huge ego. <laughs> so it's not that. It's a different kind of ego. It's it's the uh, the ego uh, where we realize that or we you know think of ourselves as a separate entity where we're in uh, word consciousness where we're holding on to consciousness. But when we let that pineal gland let go and we go into that uh, Tai Chi and Qigong flow state or that meditative alpha state, uh, then that's where we let go of being I and me. And then that's when we, we just become the flow of the universe or the Tao or whatever that's going through us. And when I do that, it's like I know that that shot is going to swish right through the net without touching the rim at all. And, mm -hmm. I, and it blows my mind how many times I can do that. Uh, you know, I just made 11 in a row yesterday when I went to the gym. To think that I could make 11 shots in a row, I mean, I, this is just so beyond me, you know, because I'm not a basketball player. You know, all mm -hmm. I do is Tai Chi and Qigong meditation, but just immersing myself in this stuff, it really opened up all these possibilities and these avenues. And we can be teaching kids how to go into this and creating space to do just wondrous things in their lives. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The other piece, too, that comes with that is if you're doing it in a group, particularly in a classroom, everybody ends up on the same wavelength, for lack yeah. of a better term. And as they're going about working on a project or trying to collaborate with each other, it takes mm -hmm. away that conflicting piece, that ego piece, where you're trying to get your idea across to the other person because you're all in the same place mm -hmm. making the decisions for the same goal. That's a brilliant insight. And that would be that would be such a huge thing, you know, for a global transformation project resolution to get it into public schools, you know, just for that one reason, you know, just to teach kids how to go into the mode of project solution, because uh, that's what gamma wave consciousness is. It takes us into solution oriented consciousness. Uh, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But yeah, that what you're talking about, uh, it's all validated with science. Uh, when we go into when we go into connective consciousness, you know, as a group. It not only uh, creates greater coherence in the group, but it ripples out through society. It actually, uh, when they, if they bring in one percent of high-level meditators into a city, it re it lowers the violent crime rate for the whole city. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you know, and talking about how minds come together as one. Uh, uh, if there's any basketball fans out there, uh, like I said, I've never I've never been a basketball fan, but I did start watching the Chicago Bulls. Because it was just such an incredible dynasty. I mean, it, it, and it was just so entertaining. You know, you had Dennis Rodman. You know, you didn't know what color his hair was going to be that day or whether he was going to wear a dress to practice or whatever. And then you had Michael Jordan, you know, the real, you know, superstar. Uh, but then Pippen, you know, you had, you had this, you know, these five guys that could just do magic, magic on a basketball court like nobody had ever done in the history of basketball and nobody's ever done it since. And anyway, Phil Jackson, uh, their coach, uh, they called him the Zen master. Uh, and he taught them all how to meditate, even Dennis Rodman. Yeah. And uh, and they all talked about it. And they all said, yeah, that had it did something. You know, it made us all one group kind of quantum mind is mm -hmm. what it did. Mm -hmm. And that's what this offers the whole planet. Uh, because, uh, like I said, the uh, they did a study in 48 cities. And they found that in all 48 cities, uh, the where they were bringing in 1%, uh, at least 1% of high-level meditators, uh, it lowered the crime rates the next year for that city, as opposed to the control cities that didn't do that. And that effect lasted for five years. So imagine what introducing a hundred, you know, hundreds of millions of new meditators around the planet into the noosphere, you know, tell her de Chardin, you know, the noosphere, uh, the global consciousness, because we can see from the science, we just had Dr. Nelson on uh, a program uh, a couple of months ago. We do a monthly program with these scientists that are uh, doing consciousness research. And mm -hmm. uh, he showed the data chart that showed how World Tai Chi and Qigong Day. And at that time, you know, there were probably only, I, I would say at the most, maybe 50,000 people around the world that were doing it on the same day. But we changed the consciousness. We created greater coherence in the consciousness of the whole planet. And so did World Yoga Day. And so did the International uh, Peace Meditation Day. And they studied hundreds of these events. And uh, yeah, and uh, they they all had a really, uh, when we go into that connection state, it has a, a much more powerful, because a lot of times in my class, when I tell people that their brain waves don't stop at their skulls, 
it makes them a little nervous because they think, wow, you know, I don't always have really good thoughts. <laughs> I don't want that going out. And I tell them, don't worry about it. Yeah, don't worry about that because those thoughts aren't powerful. Uh, what the science shows is the powerful thoughts are the connective thoughts, the healing okay. thoughts, because that's that's what connects people. That's when the, the quantum consciousness resonates. And uh, yeah, it's just a really extraordinary time to be alive because we're talking science here. But really, I mean, it almost sounds like we're, you know, talking about like, you know, any any number of the prophets from 2000 years ago, this same thing they were saying, you know, be nice to each other. We're all connected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Love is the answer to everything, you know. Yep, exactly. Exactly. Uh, my favorite um, research when I was working on my master's thesis was around uh, the idea of when you come together, that the, the chemistry immediately shifts if you mm -hmm. have a healing intention. Mm -hmm. And so I've always tried to hold on to that with mm -hmm. any activity that I've done. So even as we, the way we started the podcast is that bring that piece in, but just by coming and connecting, you've already started the healing process within the body. And it's yeah. such a beautiful way to engage with people. And you think about in a classroom, in a school, and the teachers all talking to each other and the support staff, everybody on that same piece. Every time you run into someone, it's on a healing potential. It's not on a, you know, what are we learning today kind of yeah. idea or what tasks do we have to accomplish because that's the mandate for this week. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's, it's such a different approach. And then how everybody can feel out of that. Yeah. Yeah, we, my teacher, she, she taught me when I, when I started teaching, that's one of the things that she taught me is uh, she said, Bill, before you go into a class, uh, you, you know, you want to go into that alpha state, you want to go into that state where you just, you just let go. And you want to let go of any lesson plans or any idea of what you think that class is going to be. And just touch into that connection of everybody, not the individual people, personalities, but just that higher consciousness of everybody, you know, tap into that, you know, that place. And uh, uh, and then when you've let go of everything that you think that this class is supposed to be, uh, and you just feel that drift, then that's when you want to go in and teach the class. And that changed everything. It changed everything because, uh, you, like you say, you're just, you know, it's like the only intent is for the best possible outcome of this connection of all of us coming together. And, you know, to, and if we were teaching kids how to do this, imagine how that would liberate the teachers. Uh, they mm -hmm. wouldn't have to be dealing with all these little squabbles and errant, con you know, minds dance, you know, going all over the place, you know, you know, the kids mm -hmm. would have a much greater ability to focus and consider things. And then that would allow teachers, you know, to lift to their higher potential as well. And, you know, we recommend that teachers be a part of the program. Uh, you know, it's like prisons that have adopted, you know, mind, body or meditation programs. Uh, Apodaca prison in uh, Mexico, they had one of the worst most violent prison incident incidents in Mexican prison history. And uh, what they, the response that they had for it wasn't to bring in more guards and punish uh, prisoners more. Uh, what their solution to that was, was to teach everybody in the prison how to meditate. And so they taught all the inmates, all the prison guards, all the administrators, the warden, everybody how to meditate. They haven't had a major violent incident since that happened just from teaching people how to meditate. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's like the potential of this is uh, world altering, world mm -hmm. altering. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and yeah. to know that, you know, to know that it only takes, it, you know, it, it doesn't take very many of us going in. Well, see, one of the things that I found uh, through the research that I did was that, uh, and, you know, and I, and I always bring this up. I do a lot of stress management presentations, corporations and different places. And, and one of the things that I generally always mention to them is I, is I say, uh, you know, uh, who in this room thinks that, you know, violent crime's out of control? You know, and, you know, the majority, the, the majority always thinks so. And I say, well, uh, I got some news for you. Uh, the FBI's data and the United Nations data shows that the uh, violent crime rates in the United States are at 40 year lows and not just in the United States, but in many countries around the world. Now, what has happened in the last 40 years, <clears throat> mind-body practices have spread around the planet like a wildfire. Mm -hmm. And it was the Beatles, really, that, that got that going. Because I, you know, I, I was grew up in Western Kansas. I'd never heard of meditation. I never heard any of that stuff. And then I, and then, but we all watched, we all listened to the Beatles. We all had, had all the Beatles records. 
And so when we heard that the Beatles went to med uh, India to study meditation, you know, you know, there were little kids like me all over the world that were going, wow, what's meditation? <laughs> and, uh, and so that, that really, you know, and then the Maharishi, uh, he took that fame and he created the TM Foundation. And uh, when I first found out about the TM Foundation, I was really kind of upset because they charged, I think, a couple thousand dollars for you to learn the TM technique. But, I, but I'm not anymore because they use that money incredibly well. And they invested in research. And what I realize now from being in medi you know, healthcare, uh, around healthcare for 30 years, less than one half of 1% of the NIH budget, that's where everybody gets their scientific, you know, medical research money in the US, uh, only less than one half of 1% of that goes to uh, mind, body, and alternative and complementary medicine. And that makes no sense at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Because we know that mind body dramatically boosts the T cell count, and we know that that caused people not to catch, co you know, largely not to catch COVID if they had high T cell counts. So it's insane uh, that uh, there's not a lot of money flowing into it. But it's not; it doesn't make people billions of dollars. So that you know, it's it, money runs things, and uh, you know, we just have to come to terms with that. But uh, uh, but you know, now now we know, and I kind of lost track of how I got onto that, but it had it was tied into what you were talking about. <laughs> And all of it being, how are we going to connect? And when we connect, we have that opportunity to be, be in flow and just mm -hmm. be in flow and, and not be trying to be more than we need to be, which mm -hmm. I think people spend so much time trying to be that. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I kind of, uh, yeah, I, I, okay. I, I, on the one hand, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. You know, it's like we have all these false expectations and false responsibilities that are piled on us that we think that we're expected to live up to. And it's just a huge, big stress ball, uh, you know, and it's, and it's not real. You know, a lot of it's stuff that we imagine that we think people demand of us. And it's not real if we just you know, found our esteem and our center, uh, you know, we could let a lot of that go and not necessarily uh, live that way. But with the mind body community, uh, it, there's, there's kind of another thing with that. And I think that it's really important that we not think that we're less than we are. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at the science, man, I mean, we could change the planet. If we were teaching this stuff to our, our local kids in our local public schools, we could be changing the planet. And I think it's really important for us to go, yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is a precious thing that I've spent years cultivating in my life, you know, to make my life better. And here I'm poised here, you know, to be offering it to uh, kids, you know, who are lost. Uh, they're they're mm -hmm. lost in a technological world that's not healthy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not against technology. I have three websites. I have 5,000 Facebook followers and, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> uh, but I use it as an organizing tool. I don't I don't sit there and stew in it. I don't have political arguments on it. It's, that's all a waste of time. A lot of times you're talking to robots. <laughs> And, uh, you know, you're arguing with robots, but, uh, you know, just to keep all the numbers up, you know, it's, it's, exactly. it's, a, it's a whole issue, but, uh, yeah. So how can people sign that petition? Where do they need okay. to go to do that? Yeah. You, you simply go to global transformation org, and then you'll see all over it. It'll, it'll have links to sign the petition. And then what I what I hope everybody will do is to look through some of the videos. We have all the interviews that we did with these major scientists, uh, you know, from Princeton, Heart Math Institute, uh, you know, Harvard, you know, top leading thinkers on the planet that will really change the way that you see things. And we have those videos. It's all a free public service. We do all this for free. We want to get this information out there. So when you go to globaltransformationproject.org, you can click on the tab and you can look at the past interviews that we did and discussions that we had. And then also look at the science, uh, you know, look at this science on how mind body raises IQs and, you know, test scores and math proficiency, all this stuff. Familiarize yourself with this. We should all be preaching this. Uh, you know, uh, making sure educators and education institutions know about this. And then also look at uh, look at the uh, supporters that we have from major universities all over the planet, you know, leading thinkers uh, who are, uh, you know, officially supporting this. And then uh, just look at this like, uh, you know, not like a burden, uh, but that you can be a part of a global movement that will change the planet, not just for us, but for future generations until the end of time. But it'll definitely make a better world for us if we if we get this uh, uh, to go through, and uh, uh, and so you know just starts you know mentioning it. You know <clears throat> what I always do is if I do a social media post or anything on any kind of mind body uh, science or you know any discussion or anything, 
I'll just put at the end of it, you know, no matter what it is I'm talking about, I'll put the end of it. You know, have you signed the petition, question mark, www.globaltransformationproject.org. And then let them go there and discover that. But we should be able to get millions of signatures. We should be able to build an unprecedented mind-body coalition. You know, John Cabot zinn Russell Brand, uh, Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, you know, all these people. They should they should all get behind this. This is this is just such a simple, elegant, common sense way uh, for mm -hmm. global transformation, economic transformation, healthcare transformation, you know, mm -hmm. social, political transformation. Because if we have pe you know more people with larger empathy and compassion parts of their brain mm -hmm. uh, all over the planet, and also those people are also more creative. And the research shows that mind regular mind body practitioners are much more likely to actualize the lives that they envision. And so yes. if, you know, all of us mind-body practitioners, you know, whether it's yoga, meditation, tai chi, qigong, or mindfulness around the planet, and there's, got, there's endless numbers of us, hundreds of millions of us all around the planet, you know, if we know that it can do that, uh, you know, bring that about, uh, we should be the ones that should be telling everybody about this because we're the ones that are more likely to actualize the lives that we want so we're the ones that are more likely to actualize the planet that we want mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't do that if we don't if we don't uh, accept our esteem and our value as mind body teachers uh, and mind body supporters around the planet uh we'll just it'll it'll just be a sad thing you know that it, that we didn't do it it's interesting. You've said lots of interesting things where I'll, I'll look forward to going back and um, just be able to pull little quote snippets of the way that you put words together. And this last little bit, uh, oh, now that I said that, I've lost the the, ch the train of that little piece. Um, can you repeat what you just said in that last bit? Boy, let me see if I can remember it. Um it was about us finding our esteem, uh, you know, the mind-body community, and uh, that we're more, uh, the research shows that we're more likely to be able to actualize the lives that we want to want to live than people that don't practice mind-body practices on a regular basis. And so if we can do that for ourselves in our personal lives, we should be the ones that should be able to help foster this for the whole planet. Uh, because, and I think the reason that we're more capable of doing that is because when we go into alpha state, we have to let go. We have to let go of everything that we are, everything that we think we are, everything that we believe. You can't bring any of that stuff with you. I actually had like kind of a cosmic, extraordinary consciousness experience one time. And I was trying to kind of halfway do it. And, uh, you know, whatever was giving me this experience, it said, no, can't do it that way, Bill. It's all <laughs> or nothing. It's all or nothing. You have to let go completely in order to have, uh, you know, a larger consciousness. And, uh, and so, uh, so mind body people all over the planet, we're constantly letting go of what we are so that we can become what we might be. And so we, uh, out of all the people on the planet, because as the, as I get older and as I watch everything, I realize that, man, so much of the planet is just lost. It's lost. It's, it's lost in confusion. It's lost in division. You know, the media teaches us to, you know, to, one channel teaches us to hate these people. The other channel teaches us to hate these people, you know, and division and chaos. And I just look at the world, you know, just kind of like a playground school of children. And they're all, you know, confused and chaotic, you know, and it's like they, it's like they need some kind of, uh, you know, calm, rational solution to things. And, uh, and that's what we offer with the Global Transformation Project. And so we've just got to find our esteem. And uh, not not let ourselves be treated like the you know the card table down the hall at the medical conference like we've all been treated for thirty years. Mm -hmm. It's like we th this is our time in history. Uh, well, it's the Aquarian age, is what it is, and I'm an Aquarian. So. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then that brought that brought out the idea of the piece that you said, which was actualizing the planet. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens is we actualize a lot of things. Mm -hmm. We're not actualizing the planet because what gets stuck in the way is, but I want to be able to do this, but I want, but I would like, and mm -hmm. that ego brings it back that pulls you away from that whole global piece. Mm -hmm. And so that yeah. time spent cultivating allows you that opportunity to, to find that space and that flow to be there mm -hmm. so that actualization can start to become the actual vision rather than kind of where we're kind of 
float in and out, but we're not really committed. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a general perception, especially since the pandemic and the lockdowns and everything, but there's a general, uh, see, I teach high, uh, hospital classes, uh, Zoom classes, so I'm dealing, I, 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 it's like I kind of have my finger on the pulse of society uh, as far as kind of seeing where people are. And most people coming out of that, you know, they have kind of a dismal, constricted view of possibility for the future. And, uh, and that's kind of what the, the popular culture, it really doesn't paint a very rosy picture. But when you look at the science, uh, you realize none of that is real. <laughs> Violent crime rates are at a 40-year low, a 40-year low. Uh, and, you know, as mind body spread around the planet, and uh, the planet Earth is actually vastly less violent than it's ever been before in human history. But mo most people don't know that. They just think the world is going to hell in a handbasket. <clears throat> and so it's what the mind-body community has the potential of doing if we keep bringing ourselves back to this alpha state. Because we're all, we're all challenged by that. We're all challenged with being pulled and distracted. So it's like, you know, it's like organizing something like World Tai Chi Day or a Global Transformation Project. You know, it's like you'll get a great idea and it'll be all inspiration. And then what will happen is you'll start getting pulled into some direction and approaching it from some way. And but if you keep coming back to Alpha State, you're, you're in a p place of consciousness where you can realize, oh, wait a minute. No, that's you know, that's not really going to where it's going to help this thing grow. You know, even though that may be feeding like an ego thing that I have or whatever, you know what I mean? But it's not mm -hmm. really leading to where it wants to go. And then once you get on back on track, like you say, you feel the flow. Mm -hmm. You know, you feel that effervescence and that excitement when you get on track. And so we're learning how to kind of navigate the waters and feel that flow. And, uh, you know, my God, we could be sharing this with kids all over the planet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Can you say the website again? And I know it'll be in the mm -hmm. description notes, but I just want everybody to have it. So yeah. that as they're thinking now, they're going to click on it and go and look up all this. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I can never say it enough. <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> www.globaltransformationproject.org. And you can always just Google Global Transformation Project, and it'll come right up to the top. And then, uh, yeah, please, once you look at it, sign the petition and just start sharing it with every mind, body, social media group, or, you know, just anywhere where you think uh, educators you know, put it on educator social media, anywhere where, you know, somebody would resonate with this and really the whole planet should, but educators definitely in any mind body, any, you know, any yoga group or meditation group or Tai Chi group, you know, if you have, you know, you could post it, send it to John Cabot Zen, send it to Russell Brand, send it to David Lynch with the TM Foundation. These people, you know, all these groups should be involved in this because uh, we're not asking anybody for anything. Uh, mm -hmm. All we're doing is offering our services to deliver this resolution draft to all the United Nations missions and to lobby them and interact with them. And it's going to be a lot of work. You know, I mean, we're talking, we're going to be approaching 177 nations in right, right off the bat who uh, co-sponsored the international day of yoga. So we're going to go to those 177 nations first. So we're looking at a lot of work and me and Angie, you know, we're, we're not spring chickens, you know, <laughs> we're, we're kind of in semi-retirement. And so we're committing ourselves to a massive task here so everybody out there, get it out of your head that we're asking you for something. We're offering you something. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we're mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. I always like to finish with some kind of a movement recommendation. So you've talked a lot about meditating. What's a mm -hmm. movement thing that you would typically put into your day? Well, okay. Uh, well, one of, uh, when we go through our moving Qigong, uh, what we close with is jiggling. Mm -hmm. It's like a jiggling thing. And I find that, well, it's really powerful. There was a doctor that was actually traveling all over the United States, uh, working with uh, 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 combat veterans from Afghanistan and Iraq who were suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. And all he did was just, he would just go to different cities and he would teach them how to do Qigong, you know, breathing and jiggling. And uh, uh, I don't think he called it Qigong, but that's what it is. That's where it came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, and he and those people, those guys were, uh, you know, guys and women, they were having really amazing benefits from uh, shaking stuff out. And so uh, I thought maybe we could just shake some stuff out. So, uh, uh, so you can do sure. it sitting or standing, uh, yeah. but uh, I like to I like to do it standing. And so just letting the knees bend a little bit and then letting the eyes close. And just feeling the tip of the tongue lightly touch the gum line behind the top two front teeth. And again, just feeling that sensation because that brings us more into heart-centered consciousness where we're not thinking, we're feeling. 
and feeling the cool waves of breath filling us from the abdomen all the way up through the airy fibers of the lungs. And on the sighing exhale, that wave of exhalation just comes down through our relaxing, melting body as we just melt onto the bones and sink onto the vertical axis, rooting into the earth. And now with the eyes still closed, just let, just let the Dantian bounce. So the knees give and the Dantian's bouncing and everything's jiggling. And all of those deep skeletal muscles can just sigh and just go liquid on the bones, massaging them from underneath. And even the bones and the bone marrow are being shaken out on that subatomic energy level as we just sigh and let go. So, we, so once the Dantian starts bouncing, it's like the paint can shaker down at Home Depot. You know, it just takes <laughs> off and we just let go around it. And all those deep skeletal muscles sigh and going liquid on the bones. And all the muscles around the rib cage and through the breadth of the back as they sigh, those ribs just get looser and more open. Even the muscles inside the rib cage can sigh. So we just feel it happening. We don't make it happen. We surrender. <clears throat> and now the cranium and the cranial muscles as they sigh, they jiggle a bit easier on the skull as they do. There's more space for that lightness. And the facial muscles and facial bones and the sinuses beneath and behind them, sighing and sloshing. A bit easier back there as they do. And the ears and inner ears, those tiny bones and muscles deep in the sides of the head, sighing and sloshing. And the hinges of the jaws slackening ever more as they sigh. So everything's just an energy field. That's all we are. And so the energy of the jaws can sigh and open and slacken, liquefy. And now the brain getting a nice jiggle up there, just enjoying how that feels to feel the brain jiggling. And then on that next sighing exhale, as we let that energy field of the brain sigh, enjoy the give as it just begins to go more and more liquid, just sloshing around up there. And the pineal gland right in the center of the brain that transcendent point of consciousness, the pineal gland, the center of the brain, that's where we hold consciousness. That's where we control. Uh, and so when we're thinking in words and beta brain waves, yang consciousness, there's a little bit of tension in the center of the brain, the pineal gland area. And so we just let that area just sigh and just go liquid. And when the pineal gland lets go in the center of the brain, <clears throat> everything lets go. We're no longer thinking about what we're doing. We're just, we just become the experience just the sloshing sensations and loosening and opening. Nice full breaths, really letting everything just sigh and sag. And the old brain, the brain stem in the back, sighing and sloshing, breaking up all that old panic and fear stuff back there so it can just surrender into the safety of that opening lightness. In the spine and the spinal fluid, and the whole back and all the miles and nerves just being shaken out and dusted off as they breathe and discharge the static that they've held onto. And the solar plexus and the upper abdomen, as we let that area sigh and slosh, we let go of all that panic and fear stress that we squeeze up there. And we become more open and more vulnerable. And so as that continues to sigh and liquefy, it allows space for that lightness to vibrate and echo and slosh through the abdomen and the pelvic bowl and all the organs sighing and sloshing in the kidneys and adrenal glands and the lower back. Just getting a nice massage as they let go. And the heart and the lungs, as they sigh and let go of themselves, we can feel them being gently pummeled and they're getting a nice massage. And noticing how they can sigh and let go ever deeper, let that massage in ever more deeply. It's surrender, it's not effort. And the aorta, the heart, it's getting a nice massage. And the arteries and the capillaries and the veins and even the blood is being shaken out as it too can breathe and discharges the static that it's held onto. So one last series of shakes here, seeing just how absolutely liquid we can become and letting that pineal gland let go in the center of the brain. So we just become these waves of pleasure there is nothing else. Just getting lost in it. It just feels so good to just be out of control. Just let it take us. So we don't even know how we're going to get wiggled. It just happens to us. Just a bunch of wild, out of control jigglers. 
mentally, emotionally, physically, let it all shatter, liquefy and open and enlighten. And another full breath in. And on that sighing exhale, eyes closed, but not moving. Just feeling that awakening, that tingly radiance bubbling through everything that we are. We remember what we are, which is beings of light, limitless and unfolding radiance. Let the head and the heart let go of their control, their analysis, so they can just marinate in that expansive lightness that they are. Good. All right. <laughs> Lovely. Lovely. Feels alive. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, really. We just shake off all the crap, and then all there is is life. Yeah. It was interesting. The body was kind of up down but then it went sideways at one point and then it was like oh sideways feels so much better than up and down and then you know just again that direction thing where you try to go one way and then uh -huh. multi-dimensionally being able to open up and, and and let all of those pieces come in yeah and always letting go of patterns mm -hmm. you know it's like a metaphor mm -hmm. for what we're talking about on a global scale Mm -hmm. because what really what we're talking about is letting go of old dysfunctional patterns that make no sense whatsoever because uh, there was a school in baltimore uh, and they uh, uh they, they had a detention room where they sent kids that got in trouble <clears throat> and uh, anyway they got rid of their detention room what they did was they replaced it with a meditation room and their bullying rates went down their test scores went up and so uh, so that's all we're doing here we're just uh you know as we shake off the dust uh it, it's like we're you know it's like we see that there's just these larger, more elegant ways to solve virtually everything. You mm -hmm. know, all these huge, horrific problems that they, you know, get on the news and they just, da -da 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 -da, icky, you know, it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. just nauseating. Uh, but the, the solutions are just hanging like ripe fruit. It's just, mm -hmm. and they're just so simple. And the gamma wave consciousness is what takes us to see that. And so mind-body practitioners around the world, uh, it's time to find your place in human history. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's a beautiful, beautiful way to, to leave a note and get people to say, I want to be a part of this and I want to be involved. And if you haven't done World Tai Chi and Qigong Day and found an event near you, that's the last Saturday in April every year. And uh, how many countries are involved in that now? Over 85. Uh, we don't have an exact number because we're always surprised to find countries doing it that mm -hmm. we didn't even know. Most of the, I think most of the events we never know about, but we're, but it's shocking knowing how many we do know about. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. Hundreds of cities, 85 countries. That's. Yeah. Phenomenal. Phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Bill, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing the time and the wisdom that you have. And I hope people will also check out your book and go and see it'll, the it'll change pieces. it'll change the way you see everything i mean, yeah. seriously you know i'm not even trying to sell the book uh check it out from your local library or if you sign up at worldtaichiday.org for our free weekly newsletter uh what uh several times a year i give that book away for free that's a painful thing to do when you've when you spent years writing mm -hmm. a 700 page meticulously endnoted book like a you know like a, a textbook uh, it's hard. It's hard to click that button and say it's going to be free, you know, on this day. But I do that several times a year because it'll change the way that you see everything about everything. Mm -hmm. And it'll give you an incredibly hopeful and positive vision of the future. And what the science shows, there was a 20 year study. It showed that our vision of the future is the largest determinant of what our future is going to be. Mm -hmm. So this so so. You know, having this fearful, divisive, you know, kind of mainstream popular culture way of looking at the world, and it permeates this. I know I talk to people about this, and they go, well, that doesn't affect me. Well, it affects me. It affects everybody. You know, we're in yeah. denial if we don't think it does. And so uh, to have to have a science-based vision, uh, you know, a reality-based vision that shows you just the opposite. We're at a precipice where this can become just an extraordinary adventure in the coming years. Uh, but we, but But it only happens if we open it up right here that's that's where it all starts exactly exactly beautiful thank you so much thanks <laughs> season three we're devoted to the transformational process that happens when people reach into their authentic selves and create magic our season has several publications and we hope they inspire and empower you to consider living your true heart's desire 
with love and compassion for others at the forefront. Thank you for joining us. This is Be Well with Michelle Greenwell, wishing you the courage to face your own transformation towards well-being and for the well-being of those around you. Have a great day.